Hey, Matt Johnson here, uh, coming at you with some springtime crappie action. You know, I spent a lot of my time at uh, clam and, and blackfish, talking fishing to all kinds of people. Love to chase springtime crappies, and I know a lot of our, our fans here love to do the same thing. And I know the team at Thorn Brothers is stocked to the gills with crappie gear to fit your fancy, all kinds of stuff. We're gonna run through a gamut of things to you today. Everything from how we're catching our fish, some important things you wanna remember before you hit the water and when you hit the water. Uh, some of the presentations, uh, locations, a bunch of things so that when you get this springtime crappie bug and you get out there, you catch some fish and hopefully have some success. So for starters, I always like to hit things home with, this is a great time of year to get the family out and to really level the playing field. And what I mean by that is a lot of times during this crappie fishing season, a lot of the fish start to move shallow. They migrate towards banks, they move up into cuts, they're around fishing piers. So whether you have a boat or not, you can get out there and chase down some of these fish. You can shore fish for, for big crappies. You can kayak fish. You can canoe fish. You can certainly get out on a boat. You can fish off grandpa and grandma's dock. You can hop in a pontoon. You can throw the waders on. Great time of year to get out there and chase some fish because you're starting to see what we call that shallow, shallow migration. These crappies are moving shallow. They're finding the warmest water they can. And guess what? They're putting on the feed bag. So there's a lot of the variables that are dependent on success this time of year. You're going to hear me talk about temperature. I'm going to say temperature quite a bit because there's so many things that are important about temperature. Water temperature, air temperature, all sorts of stuff that make or break a day of fishing. And you can change your success rate by focusing on temperature. And we're going to talk about that throughout today. But you're going to just talk about all kinds of stuff. We're going to talk about lures that catch fish, whether it's swimming lures, whether it's hair jigs and bobbers you're going to see us break that down uh, we're going to talk about you know the importance of uh, not leaving your ice fishing jigs at home different kinds of plastics the floats we like to use some of the applications to uh, help you get ready for a day on the water so for starters homework why am i talking about homework you say you know you don't want to go back to school i get it i'm not telling you to do that some of these kids though that are watching you're probably in school or you should be so doing your homework means studying your navionics chip on your phone Studying the Navionics map cards on your Lowrance or your Hummingbird, sit in the boat, plan your day of fishing because if you hit the body of water and you're not ready to catch fish and you don't have a plan, man, you're one step behind. What happens if you go to spot A, the only spot you want to fish, and nothing happens and you can't find fish and they're not biting? You want to have a plan B, C, D, E, F, whatever it might be, ready to go in your brain so that you can get after it and chase down these fish. Time wasted is time you can't be setting hooks. So pay attention to some of the nuances of where you want to fish. On big bodies of water like Minnetonka, Wiper Lake, Forest Lake, Waconia, who knows? They're big. You may be moving quite a bit. You don't want to waste time driving across the lake. So plan your day, mark your spots, pay attention to those north areas, areas that iced up first, uh, darker bottom that maybe bring in more heat. These are all things that these crappies are gonna to gravitate towards. They're gonna to look for those north and western areas of the lake because guess what? That's what gets the sun the first, the fastest. That's where the ice melted first. You have that sun rising in the east and setting in the west and the fish will generally find those areas. Uh, however, I've caught plenty of fish on south shoreline, sh south uh, you know, back channels and bays, but I bet you when you get back into that back channel and bay, even on the south side of the lake, that north and northwest side of that little back cubby is gonna be where you catch most of your fish. So pay attention to some of those details. So that's where doing your homework ahead of time, before we even talk about any of this or even hook the boat up, you're ready and prepared to go fishing. Study the lake you're gonna fish, find the lake you wanna fish, look at a big or small lake, depending on how much wind we're gonna get, all those things so you can plan your day effectively. We went fishing a couple weeks back on a very windy day and we focused on a lake that had ample spots out of the wind because we're talking 20 30 mile an hour winds it's one thing to fish in the wind i get it i don't mind fishing in the wind but if it's 20 or 30 mile an hour winds and i got three kids in the boat fishing in the wind is no fun so focus on the lake where multiple spots are out of the wind same thing with a boat launch i learned early on that most of april the docks aren't in yet so if you're going to be fishing and going out of a boat launch where the wind is crashing in there and you have no dock keep that in mind so these are things you want to think about before you get out and do some early springtime fishing getting into the meat and potatoes now of crappie fishing. What are we doing? How are we catching our fish? Now you heard me talk about ice fishing. I'm gonna reference ice fishing a few times because I think we need to think like ice fishermen these first few weeks of open water. You should always bring your ice jigs with you. Now I just carry a handful of ice jig boxes like this from the boat. I'm not bringing every ice fishing lure I have, but carry your select offering of ice jigs because we just got done fishing two, three weeks ago, ice fishing, and what do we fish? 
small number 10 and 12 drop kick jigs from clam or a Mackie minnow or whatever it might be we weren't fishing three or two inch twister tails and two inch tube jigs and big crappie minnows we weren't doing that the fish wouldn't take it we we're using small offerings so you better believe it right away after ice out and for the few weeks after that until the water temps start to warm up into the mid to upper 50s consistently they're going to take these ice jigs so when i first hit the open water scene i'm fishing the same thing I had on my rice fishing rod. That's a number 12 drop kick and a small Mackie minnow. That's what I'm fishing. And depending on where I'm fishing and what I'm doing, that's going to dictate whether or not I use a float or I fish it straight up. And you're probably saying, Matt, you're psycho. You're going to fish that tiny jig straight up. Well, I'm using four pound test line, ultralight rod, ultralight reel. Sure. And again, remember, I am not using this application right off the bat, fan casting an area. Much like ice fishing, I'm getting on top of where the fish are. I'm finding them on my electronics because they're generally on weed lines or out in the basin and I'm dropping it and I'm feeding it line. And yes, you slow down and you pay attention to the nuances of where your line enters the water. You watch your rod tip. This is a feel game and you're going to see what these fish do. So I'm going to fish this smaller offering. And if I can get away with it on a slip bobber or let's say a fixed float, I'll do that too. But again, the point behind this is don't leave the ice fishing stuff in your garage. These will catch fish. Our two biggest crappies are first outing. We rifled through a pile of fish. Our two biggest crappies, two big old slab 13 inchers, came on this tiny little jig, open water fishing. It wasn't a big hair jig. It wasn't a twister tail. It wasn't a beetle spin. It was none of that. It was small little ice jigs. So don't neglect those. Keep them with you. And in fact, you can catch bluegills and stuff on these little ice jigs all year round. So there's a good shot. You're going to see me have these in my boat from now until I put my boat away and it goes right back into my ice fishing arsenal. So this trusty little jig box comes with me everywhere I go. So I can catch bluegills as well all summer long. So micro ice jigs and small ice jigs have a place in open water. And again, we've talked about tungsten and the advantages of tungsten, small profile, but fishes heavy. So even though this is a small profile jig, it fishes fairly heavy. So I can fish this jig relatively effectively in deeper water over the side of the boat, even in open water. So good setup you wanna have out there to chase fish. So that's an easy approach right away when you get it open water. And that's kind of how you're going to get these finicky, finesse-driven fish to bite. You're going to hit them with finesse approaches. That's an important tactic because right away, off, right when open water hits, water temps are in the 40s, surface temps, and you may find something teetering at 50 if you go into a back channel. So fish slow and concentrate on some of that stuff. So another thing that I might put on the end of that is something with scent, something with juice. And this is going to be just a gulp alive. There's many brands out there that have juice or scents or other things in them are built with certain materials that give you the upper hand. I'm not big on fishing, let's say, a crappie minnow or something to that effect right away after, after ice out. I try to rely on slow moving stuff. These fish are coming up. If you watch them on a the camera, they're coming up slow and they're just barely picking up your baits. So I'm fishing something artificial that I have the control. And if it's not a plastic, I'm going to hair jig. And we're going to talk about hair jigs and why they can be super effective for open water fishing as well. So hair jigs. This is another approach that I will fish a lot right away this time of year when I'm starting to fish open water crappies. And you'll see right off the bat, I don't have any weight on my line anywhere here. So many anglers crimp on a bunch of sinkers to get this jig down to balance out the bobber. Well, you don't want to do that. I'm going to balance out my float and I'll show you this float setup. I'm going to balance out my float appropriately from the size of the float so that I get my desired accent. I'm not going to add weight down here to get my float to sink to where I want it. And that's going to help you dictate on these up biting crappies. You're going to have an upper hand and you're going to see these fish bite in a different manner. So I'm just fishing little hair jigs. This is just a 32nd ounce or even a 164th hair jig. No bait. That thing flattens out beautiful in the water. Looks just like a pin minnow. Everything these little crappies are feeding on, tiny pin minnows or even these little one inch minnows and small offerings and insects and whatever else it might be as this water warms up in these back little bays and channels and I'm using this hair jig. And I'll show you this bobber setup I'm using. And it's, it's relatively simple. And, and a lot of anglers, you know, don't think this way, but I'll show you exactly how I'm using this. This is just a fixed float. You can see there, I got two split shot. So this bobber can't move. So I'm adding the weight at the float. I'm not adding it down below. This helps me cast this float. And again, I'm not using this setup in super deep water. So if I'm fishing, let's say a float in eight, 10, 12 feet of water, you're not doing this because this, there's too much line. That's where you would use a slip bobber. But when I'm fishing three, four feet down, 
this is what I'm doing. So it's super nice to show you how I'm fishing this, this float. You can see two split shot, and it's just a small little balsa float. So when that thing's in the water, let's see if I can get this up, show you what I'm, my concept on camera. When this is in the water, you can see both little, little weights. That's sinking the float down. It's also helped me with castability. I want that water right there. That's where I want that water level. So that when that fish bites it, it takes almost no resistance to pull that float down. Or if it pops it and turns it up like this, because it picks up the weight, you could set the hook too. So the other day we were fishing, and it was funny, I had some other anglers sitting by me and my kids, and I was using this exact setup. So you can see my float, my jig, you're only about three and a half, four feet down, just using this light jig. So when I cast this jig, I'm relying on the jig just to pendulum and float down to the fish, almost neutrally buoyant. It's so natural, it's so enticing that these fish can't resist it. So instead of a jig bombing down or a crappie minnow going all over the place when you kind of got a negative fish, this hair jig just kind of floats right down, just like that, right into the strike zone. And that crappie comes up and picks it up. So now I'm watching that bobber, that little bobber. Probably can't see it on camera. That's okay. You already got a wind of it. I'm watching that bobber much like I would a spring bobber ice fishing. So I'm watching that bobber for just the smallest little bump, the smallest little movement, and after a few miss of the hook sets, hook sets are free in fishing. I think everyone knows that. You think you have a fish, you set the hook. Once I see that bobber twitch or move or dance, you start to pick up when that bite happens. So just like your spring bobber in ice fishing, you see that bobber just kind of bop up and you kind of know. A lot of anglers want to watch that spring bobber go. Phew, phew. This isn't doing that. Just like the spring bobber is not doing that ice fishing. It's just kind of bumping up. This is doing the exact same thing. So I'm fishing similar mentality as I was ice fishing. Slowing down, finesse approaches. And I'm using ultralight or light action rods. I'm using a six and a half foot or seven foot rod. I'm using a 500 to a 1000 series Shimano reel. I'm using four pound test line and I can get after most situations in this setup. So hair jigs, definitely something I think is oftentimes overlooked. A lot of anglers wanna get out there right away and fish a crappie minnow or like I said, something too big. So play with hair jigs. And there's a variety of different hair jigs out there. You have the flu flu type with feathers and then you have real hair jigs here. This is actually one my, my son made and ties up. Just a small little jig. You got a little piece of hackle and some hair. All of these components, everything you see on here was purchased at Thorn Brothers. We're actually over there in the fly angler. So he buys all this stuff. He paints his own heads. He buys the plain jig heads. He gets the thread. He gets all the stuff. You know, go over and talk to Stroof and the team over there in the fly angler and he'll set you up with all this stuff to tie your own jigs. And it's fun. And there's some pride in it to say I went back and caught some fish on my same jig. And all these rods were built at Thorn Brothers. Lonnie and his team built these up. You can have panfish rods built to your specifications. It's not just bass and walleye and musky. You can go up there and talk to the gentleman and the team in the rod shop and have custom built panfish rods built. And I had this built to my exact specifications. You know, my length of handle, my little split grip in the back, all those fun things. So you can have these custom built rods. Both of these I've shown you so far are custom built rods right at Thorn to match the needs for your pan fishing action. So hair jigs, definitely something you do not want to overlook. If you're not fishing hair jigs, I would say most of the spring or even during the spawn, which is a weeks away, you're missing out. So the spawn's not happening right now. That's a misnomer. A lot of people think that this migration here in the shallows right now is, oh, the fish are moving up to spawn. They're not, we're weeks away from them. They're moving up because it's comfortable, it's warm, it feels good, they're chasing bait fish. Then they're gonna re re-migrate onto main lake structure, oftentimes to spawn, still shallow, but main lake, then they start to spawn. We're talking weeks away, mid to upper 50 degree water temp, average consistency, if not 60, main lake weeds, they're gonna slide back out in a few weeks and do their thing. So right now we're chasing fish that are going in for that spring fling to go chase down uh, warmer water. So other presentations to catch fish, there's a variety of ways. I do wanna take a step back in terms of location. And uh, I wanna talk about some of the deeper applications because we have caught a bunch of fish deeper. It's not all about these shallow back channels, these back boat, boat harbors, these creeks and inlets. While they do hold fish, don't negate deeper water fish right now because a lot of these bigger fish will sit on the weed lines, they'll sit in the basin still, they have not moved in and some of them never will. So there are definitely some approaches that you should look at for deeper water. And I'm gonna show you some things that helped us catch some fish. For starters, a plain jig head and a twister tail or something of that effect. And this just happens to be a 1 16th ounce tungsten jig. So Clam Outdoors came out with the Drop TG several years back. It's a tungsten jig, small profile. You can see it here, just a small profile head. I'm using just a small inch and a half, two inch twister tail. 
but that fish is heavy. It's a 16th ounce jig. No different than a 16th ounce spoon ice fishing where I can throw that thing in 35, 40 feet of water and get all the way down quick. I can fish this again, four pound test line, nice light action or ultralight panfish rod, small ultralight reel. I can fish this effectively in open water. So now I can cover that outside weed line, deep basin stuff, pay attention to my electronics for schooling fish, and I can pitch this into the school and get some of those fish to bite. This is a situation where I think you can fish a larger, larger offering. And I say that because when I'm targeting fish on weed lines or over basins and they're more nomadic and they're in expansive schools, these fish are specifically targeting bait fish. They're chasing minnows, they're more aggressive, they're chasing pods of, of mini chubs and all kinds of stuff, small shiners. That's where you can get away with a bigger presentation. So if I'm fishing deeper, oftentimes I will fish a little larger because one, they'll eat it and two, it's more comfortable for me. I can feel things, I have more control. So it's amazing how you might change your approach from shallow to deep. So if I'm fishing outside weed lines, basin, I can get away with a larger jig, twister tail offering and get after it. But great setup here. Again, I'm just using a seven foot light action, custom built rod. Lonnie actually painted a crappie on that blank for me years ago. And that guy is mighty talented. So you can do the same thing there and fish that pretty effectively. Another really cool lure that has taken the industry by storm, I'd say over the last, oh, six to 10 years, is a swimming lure. A lot of anglers are using these to catch walleyes, to catch bass. It's a very popular ice fishing lure. We've seen them for a long time. So I'm fishing that small tika minnow. That's gonna be your swimming type bait, your swimming minnow. And uh, this has really been a big one for us on the ice fishing side of things. You see how cute that thing is. That's a 16th ounce little swimming lure and they come in 16th ounce, eighth ounce, all the way up to, uh, uh, you're gonna see one coming out as big as seven eighth ounce. But for crappies, I'm fishing the smaller sizes. Now I can effectively drop this down, rip jig it a bit, and chase those schooling panfish. So just like I showed you that drop TG, that jig head with the twister tail, same concept. I can fish this over the side of the boat or I can even pitch it a ways. And it has wicked action. It darts off, it kicks way to the side. It's got sticky sharp hooks and it catches a pile of crappies. So if you're looking for another fun way to chase them, uh, try that Tika minnow. And I do go to like a light action rod. I'm not fishing an ultra light with this because it does have a little more weight to it and has a little more, and uh, changes the action if your rod's too whippy. Just like when you're ice fishing, you don't want a big floppy rod when you're fishing this lure. It's the same thing I'll look at when I'm fishing open water. So I'm using a light action custom built rod. I got a, a 1000 series Shimano on there, four pound test line and away I go. And uh, the color offering in these tikas is pretty darn cool. I mean, you got about everything you could think of. I just showed you just a, a purple fire tiger, but you got, I'll pull a couple out here. You got natural colors like your, your minnow, your golden shiner and your minnow baits and all that kind of stuff. So you can really, really fit that profile of what the fish are feeding. Are they fishing on golden shiners, small perch? Are they fishing on smaller pin minnows? That sort of thing. Are they fishing, are they feeding on you know, bluegills, are they feeding on, what are they feeding on? Because big crappies will also eat little bluegills. Now you've got ones that look like bluegills, a little red underbelly, all kinds of stuff. So you can really match the exact presentation or what they consider match the hatch to get out there and chase some fish. So this swimming bait's super cool. If you haven't fished one of those, I'd highly recommend it. And I like it in the springtime, especially if I have to move deep, if I have to be on a weed line, I like it because I can fish it with gloves on pretty effectively. I can have on my, uh, my Blackfish Air gloves and I can be there with a the rod in my hand if it's cold out because we're going to be out there fishing in some cold conditions. We can't pick the weather. We all know that. And if your only day to fish is this coming Saturday and it's going to be 50 degrees and rain or 40 and wind, you can be effective with a pair of gloves on. You can be out there where the fish are in the strike zone and fish some of these heavier baits with a pair of gloves on and be comfortable. So those swimming lures are something you definitely want to add to the arsenal if you haven't already. Now moving on down the line. I wanted to talk a little bit about float applications in deeper water. So we talked about floats in shallow water. You saw how I'm fishing that. Now I want to show you more of a slip bobber setup that you can fish in deeper water. And I just happen to have just an ice buster bobber rigged up. And I had this rigged up for my kids. And my kids actually helped me rig this in the garage. It was just super fun. It's a time of year to get the kids involved, have them help you pick out what they should be fishing, get them involved in it, teach them about the sport. That's fun. So I'm using the, the ice buster bobber. Got my slip knot down there, I can adjust this wherever it wants. So if I need to fish six or eight feet down, I can fish a little deeper with this slip bobber. And you can also use this ice buster bobber. You saw me show you that fill where I pegged it on both sides. 
You can certainly peg this the same way. So you can see my setup there. I got a bead and a weight. Instead, you would put a weight and a weight and fix and fish this fixed. And you can do it on the same setup. You don't need to take your knot off or anything. So if you decide to slide up into a shallower boat channel, instead of using the slip knot, I can go and peg this and I can have that same approach. I can get the weight away from the jig and I can fish this as a peg system as well. And this is just a small little one inch twister tail, tiny little 132nd ounce jig head, nothing fancy. But I'm telling you, just this small stuff is what's catching your fish right after ice up. You don't need to overthink it. Just a small little offering. My son Brody, uh, who's uh, eight years old, was out fishing with this, just crushing fish. This is just a five, five foot ultralight. We found this around in the garage. Again, he wanted to set it up. This is his favorite ice fishing reel. It's a true blue reel from Clam. He's got the orange, of course, orange frost ice line. This is the setup he wanted to fish. And I said, you know what, buddy, let's go for it. And I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you if I didn't say he caught as many fish, if not more than the rest of us. So he's out there slinging this thing, catching fish. Easy way to catch him. So that's just a slip bobber approach. So if I'm going to be fishing, uh, let's say, deeper weed lines or something of that effect, or if I have a younger kid in the boat, uh, if I'm casting this first setup, like you can see again, the bobber's up here. You're talking four feet of line. It's kind of a pendulum action. This is a little more tricky to cast if you're just getting into the sport. If I got a young in my boat or somebody that's more of a novice, I'm going to probably put them on a slip bobber because everything kind of comes down closer to the casting point. So when they cast, it's easier to manipulate where that lure is going to go. And I'm telling you, that's good for the angler and it's good for everybody else in the boat because it's all fun and games until one brother hooks the other brother or one brother hooks their dad and then we got a problem on our hands. So if you have somebody out there that's getting into it for the first time, maybe rigging up a slip bobber application, even if you're going to fish shallow, can help you catch some fish. You know, I do want to touch on live bait. I do think there is a place in time. We will oftentimes bring maggots or wax worms with us early in the season. Mash run on, throw it on your hook for scent. If we have a really negative bite where I'm actually seeing fish come up and they're not taking it, I might put a maggot or a wax worm on my bait as added attraction. And certainly, if you're a minnow guy or gal and you want to fish a crappie minnow, then I would definitely say do it. You can catch plenty of fish on a crappie minnow too. You can fish it the same way. A lot of anglers will use a plain hook, split shot, and your favorite bobber setup. So definitely grab a scoop of crappie minnows, bring them with. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive. You can get a scoop of crappie minnows for three, four bucks at Thorn Brothers. Throw them in a bucket. You have them with you in case you need them. And some days you never know. We've also caught fish on just minnow heads. Just like we do ice fishing, I just put a minnow head on a jig or on a spoon and fish it over the side of the boat. So just like we're fishing the jig head, and the tika, we talked about fishing the tika vertically over the side of the boat. You can fish a jigging spoon. I've many times chased fish with a jigging spoon over the side of the boat. And then you can put your minnow head on there or your bait of, of choice. So great applications for chasing down some of these fish. You know, we also talked about, you know, different types of bobbers and floats. There's another bobber out there that's prevalent. Is it's a, a just a bubble. And this thing slides on your line. You can fish it fixed by twisting this and it tightens up or you can fish it as a slip bobber. You also can pull this thing open and fill it with some water. You can see I pull that up, I can put some water in there, it tightens back up and that gives me some weight. So if I put just a little bit of water in here, I can cast this thing a long ways. It's called an adjustable bubble. They come in a bunch of different sizes and colors. They work well too if you're trying to get into the, that type of game. But uh, again, bring your offering of stuff. You can see I have all kinds of things I bring with me with my boat. I got tackle boxes full of plastics, all different colors and sizes and shapes. You never know what the day is going to bring to you. It's just like any aspect or any species out there, whether it's you hardcore bass anglers or wall anglers or musky, musky fishermen. We all have our baits. We have our favorites, our go-tos, but it's also fun. It's also that hobby where you can start to build a collection and you can find colors that work and colors that don't work. And again, so some of the key characteristics, some of the key things you want to think about when you're fishing springtime crappies. We're going to go through this one quick time. So it's kind of a Run down these bullet points. Temperature, focus on temp temperature. This is the time of year where temperature is super important. Water temperature dictates where these fish are. Find some of the warmer water, find more fish. Pick, you pick your battles, pick the lakes you wanna fish depending on wind conditions, where you're gonna go, how much you're gonna move, where is the access in relation to the wind, if the docks are in yet. So pick your battle, do your homework, find the spots you wanna fish, plot your day. Know where you're gonna go if spot A doesn't work. Know where you're going to go with spot B doesn't work, and so on and so forth. Think about how you're going to fish. Are you going to be fishing deep? Are you going to be fishing shallow? How should I have my rods rigged? Think of all those sorts of things. You want light line, three pound test, four pound test, five pound test line. 
One of the biggest mistakes a lot of pan fishermen do right away in the spring is they have too heavy a line. It's six or eight pound test line, it's coiled up. That's gonna not help you catch fish. They got too stud of a rod, too big of a jig. Think small, bring your ice fishing stuff. Don't throw the drop kicks away, put them in your boat. Don't let them sit in the garage all summer or put them in your boat so you can use them in the spring. Think small, think like you did ice fishing two, three weeks ago to catch these fish. If you are float fishing, balance your float properly. Make sure that float is balanced so that that fish doesn't have much effort to pull it down, whether it's going down or whether it's going up. This is a strike indicator. Too many anglers wait to set the hook when their bobber goes all the way down. And sometimes that's because it's not properly balanced. When that crappie bites that bait and starts to barely swim away, that bobber should float down with it. It shouldn't even know it's there. That's how you want to properly balance your float. So make sure you pay attention to some of those things. Hair jigs. If you're not using hair jigs, I would definitely invest in some hair jigs. Heck, like I said, talk, talk to the guys in the fly shop and get some stuff to tie your own. That's what my son's doing. He's having a blast doing it, and he's taking pride going out and catching fish on the things he's using. Rod combinations. You're going to use anything, I would say, from an ultralight to a light action, and uh, I prefer six to seven foot rods. You did see the shorter rod for my son. He likes that, but six to seven foot ultralight or light action rods are going to be your rods of choice. And again, fish a body of water where there's some crappies prevalent. That's oftentimes said, should be without being said, but oftentimes I hear a lot of anglers do that sort of stuff. They go walleye fishing and go, I didn't catch anything, and then I find out what lake they fished on, and there's probably seven walleyes in the entire lake. So find a body of water where there's a decent population of crappies. Go to the Minnesota, Minnesota DNR website, do some research. What do the net surveys look like? What are the sizes? What do you expect for a day of fishing? Are you gonna chase a big fish or you're talking about numbers? Again, this all comes back into homework. You also wanna remember important tips for springtime fishing. Clothing. If you're uncomfortable on the water, you're not gonna to wanna to be out there. Bundle up. I get into, get into this with my kids all the time. Put on an extra sweatshirt. I don't care if you're going to take it off 10 minutes into the day. Put on the extra sweatshirt. So wear the extra sweatshirt, the long pants. I'm wearing my soft shell bibs from Blackfish and my Gale hoodie all the time. I got my rain suit in the boat in case I need it. I got a stocking cat and a, pair, and a pair of gloves. You know what? I can easily take them off if I start to get warm. But if you get out there and you're an hour into fishing and the bite starts to pick up and all of a sudden somebody in the boat's complaining because they're cold, it makes for a long day. So properly wear the clothing you need to stay warm, on the, warm in the water. And other just key elements to, the, to fishing this time of year, a lot of you are gonna be out for the first time, do a full inspection of your boat. This is not the time of year to start your motor for the first time on a super busy Saturday. So if you haven't started your motor yet, keep that in mind and be respectful of some of the other boaters. Maybe dump in a smaller, less popular lake, check some of those things, life jackets, throwable, bumpers, anchors, life, uh, fire extinguisher, are your batteries charged? Those are just simple things to keep in mind, tools, hook out, check your trailer tires. So there's a lot of things we want to think about too as we get into fishing this spring. So not just springtime crappie fishing, we're excited. This is the cool stuff. But if your boat doesn't run and you can't get to the water, it doesn't matter about any of the gear that you have. So springtime fishing is meant to be fun, meant to have a good time. I know you can get out there and chase some crappies. The best is yet to come. It does get better, believe it or not, every week as these water temps warm up. Uh, we found water temps as warm as mid to low 50s in the last week. We did get some cold rain, and, and those water temps are dropping back down. But again, we're going to get some warmer days. That sun's getting higher. It's getting hotter. It's warming things up faster. Well, things are greening up, and we're going to continue to have a successful spring crappie season. So a lot of questions, I'm sure, uh, on this that a lot of you guys have over the years. Hopefully this answered some of them. Again, talk to the team at Thorn Brothers, stop into the flying layer. These guys are dialed in, they fish, they live it, they breathe it, they sleep it. They're out there doing it. So ask them some of these questions, what's working? They may have a recent fishing report. Uh, lean on your network to, to provide the best outcome for a day on the water. So hopefully this helps shed some light on springtime crappie fishing. I'm excited to get back out there. I know I'm gonna put some of these to use. I'm gonna be catching some fish on some hair jigs here in the next couple days and uh, getting out there and making sure this boat gets wet and gets put to use catching big fish. And if you're out there catching them, have a good time. Keep some for a meal, practice selective harvest. If you get a giant crappie, take a picture on your phone, let it go, keep the smaller ones for dinner because they do taste good out of this cold water. So get out there, have some fun, be safe, and have a great spring.